like you are I already. Just you just clicked. clicked Amazing. It. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. So if you're watching this on playback, hello, welcome to the playback of me talking about Git. Uh, we're going to talk about Git, not me, the software. Haha, -ha, jokes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but no, for those of you who aren't aware, Git is a, uh, a, piece of, a piece of software that is widely used across the industry, I would say, uh, is, is, is a pretty um, under understatement uh saying widely used if you've heard of websites like github and gitlab um they're all centered around a piece of software called Git. so um i guess first off let's talk about the 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 why the how and the what so why do we actually need this stuff so oh my god i had a dog bark. um so why do we actually need this stuff so uh, vcs or scm or version control systems or source con source control management um Software like Git um, is essentially used to track changes, to store code, find this code, share this code with other people, um, collaborate it without being, without like collaborate on code without conflicting, overwriting people, be able to write code, like put it into place and then go, ah, oh, no, we screwed up, we need to revert it, being able to do that and then organize our code in general. So like, Let's say you're working on like multiple different projects. Um, you could have those in multiple different places. Um, so we want to organize our code in a reasonable way. And there are lots of different ways of doing that. There are like ways of bundling all your code in one place, um, often called a monorepo. And there's lots of ways that you can uh, split out your code in lots of different places, um, which is more of the kind of classic traditional way of doing things, um, but also especially in this era of like microservices, if you've ever used, if you've ever heard that term, um, then uh, yeah, like what is, code into lots of different places. What is an example of a microservice for those? Um, I, uh, an example of a microservice, well, like microservices in general is essentially it's a piece of software that runs on a server. So on like Facebook servers or Google servers or, or whatever, if it's your website, it's a website. Um, and it will do something and it will do one, like it'll mainly deal with like um, one particular set of tasks uh, that are all highly related to one another. So let's say you're applying for, um, to register your car and your number plate with like your government's uh, registration system, you might have a microservice that just deals with um, retrieving a bunch of data and sending that submission in. And then you might have other microservices dealing with um, like pulling in different bits of information from different sources. Uh, maybe one microservice to do with um, pulling in information about the car that you're registering or, or something like that, I don't know. So you can have like lots of these different systems um, working together to achieve a general overall goal. Um, there tend to be lots of simple systems. And when you're working with version control, like with Git or with any other version control system, you tend to want to store your code in um, what we call repositories, uh, which we'll get a little onto later. Um, and these repositories will essentially like store like the code for each individual microservice. Um, of course, there are other ways to organize your code like a monorepo where you store all of your code in a single repository. There are pros and cons to both. Excuse me, I'm hiccuping. Uh, there are pros and cons to both ways of organization. Um, I don't want to give an opinion on which way is best to do it, but I would totally say the best way to do it is not a monorepo. Um, but I know there will be some, if somebody watches this back and is like staunchly advocating for monorepos, I'll get some angry emails. So I'll try and refrain from giving too many opinions about how to actually work with this stuff uh, and just actually go through the basics. So this is why we need it. We want to track our changes. We want to version control things. We want to store our code in a place and collaborate on it. 
So how we want to work with it. We want it to be easy and fast to use. We want to collaborate on it super easily. We don't want to like have messy things where I've done a bunch of stuff and then another developer has done a bunch of stuff. And that's all massively conflicting. And and there's like loads of stuff that we just have to deal with. Or like, oh, like they've developed a bunch of stuff and it's overwriting things of mine and and we have to manually figure all that out. I don't want to deal with all of that stuff. I just want a tool to help me sort out that stuff. Uh, we would ideally want a st small storage space. We don't want necessarily want to track every single like copy of file ever since it changed. Um, we want to store as as we want to have the storage of our versioning uh, be as little as possible. Um, we want to track these historical changes of these versioning. So let's say I changed something in our code two months ago. I want to be able to find out who did it, me. What I did, maybe I changed, I don't know, the color of a website background, uh, where I did it in the code, when I did it, why I did it, what was the what was the um, reason for why I did it. Um, and so we want to try and be able to track and determine all these things with our version control software. Uh, ideally, we want good support across the industry so that it's it's something that any developer who joins an organization um would will join and already know how to do or will easily be able to pick it up because it's um such a standard and if they then go to somewhere else it's a transferable skill and we want it to be reliable because code is super important i'm sure you've heard in the news many people many companies have had like leaks of uh, of their source code of their video games or their websites and things and that um that causing like vulnerabilities and stuff. So we want a reliable system that is going to be able to store our code, not lose it. Um, and uh, we want to be able to like easily access it and work with it. And um, yeah, so that's how we want to work with it. So uh, we can do all of that with a lovely bit of versioning software called Subversion or SV. No, I'm totally fucking kidding. Like we're not gonna be talking about Subversion. We're gonna be talking about Git. We're going to be Whoosh. talking about this this lovely, Whoosh. lovely piece of uh, software called Git. By the way, if you ever get anywhere near the subversion uh, version control system, get away from it as quickly as possible. I worked with it for a short period of time, and it's horrible. Um, so no, we're going to work with Git. Git's a great piece of software. So what is Git? It's a versioning. It's a version control software. It's uh, it was released in two thousand five, written by Linus Torvalds. Um, if you've not heard of Linus Torvalds, you might have heard of a um, uh, an operating system or like a, a, a component of an operating system called Linux. Um, like most people have heard of Linux if you go like, oh yeah, it supports Windows and Mac and Linux. And not many people don't know what Linux is, but it's essentially just like a, a very, very, very good piece of efficient software that sort of is like an operating system. Uh, it's, completely, it's completely free, it's completely open source um it is used like on like in servers and things it is the most used piece of the most used operating system most servers don't run windows or mac os or anything like that they will run some version of linux um so the guy who invented linux and still works on linux to this very day and heads up the linux team is this guy called linus torvald um yes it was actually named after him um he named it after himself. He's a bit of a narcissistic prick, um, but he's also a very clever software programmer and he also wrote it. Um, it's a terminal application. So we'll be working inside a terminal or a command line. Um, so if you're a little bit afraid of a terminal or a command line, we're gonna be diving in the deep end. I'm gonna start to introduce you some terminal concepts and things. Um, you can use like a, a proper application with like a UI and work with it in that way. Um, it can make things a little bit more complicated. It can make things a, a lot easier. Um, I found when I'm talking about Git concepts with other people and working with Git, that generally the foundational concepts, working with it in a terminal is um, like having those foundational concepts is amazingly useful um, because no matter what application you're gonna be using, the, the terminal is what Git is written for. Um, and it's super powerful. So, and it's also really easy to work with uh, in a terminal. So it's super good. It's got like, even like colors and all sorts of stuff in a terminal. So we don't have to worry about that. 
Uh, it's got a super small storage space. Um, it actually only tracks changes. It doesn't actually track every single version of your file. So if you if you make an edit to your code and and put the and record this stuff in Git or commit it in Git, we'll get to that concept a little later. Um, then it actually doesn't take a full copy of all of your files and store that. It just stores what you've changed, uh, and that way. Um, it is able to keep track of all of these things. It also makes it super fast. It also makes it super easy to collaborate on because if, you, if you've if you got two developers who are working on a code base and they've made a bunch of changes, but none of them actually clash with one another, none of the changes clash with one another, um, then you can just both merge your code in and, 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 and get the piece of software out quicker uh, without having to deal without having to deal with or worry about the fact that you might have overwritten each other's changes. Uh, and if you have, then Git has um, systems in place to help you resolve those changes, resolve those uh, conflicts. Um, it tracks historical changes. It tracks like who did things by a username. It tracks when you did it with a timestamp. It tracks where it did it because it's just recording changes in the code base. Um, it tracks um, like why you did it because every time you want to record something into the Git version control system, um, you have to commit it. You have to record it uh, with a message, and that message is basic is usually just like a description of what you've done. Um, so, and and good commit messages are usually what you've done for a reason, and so you're like kind of describing that reason in a concise way. It's got good support across the industry. It is literally the foundational piece of software that um, is underlying like GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and all of these sorts of pieces of software that are out there. Um, and I, one of the amazing technical things about it is that it is completely independent. It is not reliant on any sort of internet access. It is not reliant on um, any other bits of software that are running on your computer. If you install Git on your computer, you can have a complete repository with all of these features uh, built right into it. And then if you want to back up it, back up your repository, you can use services like GitHub and GitLab and all this sort of stuff. Um, but it is essentially completely independent. You do not have to um, use a backup system to be able to record changes and everything. Each repository is its completely independent system, uh, which can be really powerful. Um, so we're going to learn on the go. We're going to go through these uh, topics. I'm going to refer back to this list uh, along the way. But these are essentially like concepts that we'll go through and, and learn about as we're going through all of this. Um, I'm going to try and be as quick as possible to cover all of it. But I'm also going to try and take my time over it and explain to all of you um, how each one of these works, what it actually is, what you're going to be working with um, so that you understand it. Because what's the point in me talking about something and teaching you it if you don't understand it at the end of it? And please, 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 if you have joined after I said earlier, uh, just ask questions in the chat. Um, Brittany is there, uh, who's the co-leader and founder of this uh, coding group. Um, she will pick up questions and shout out to me if there are questions in the chat, which I will actually ask for now. Brittany, are there any questions in the chat? Currently, there are no questions in the chat, but please Amazing. feel free to ask questions. There are no such thing as dumb questions in this group. And Absolutely. we need to interact and get distracted yeah. and help people. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I mean, after all I just go off track a little bit. Sorry. Exactly. Oh. Like after after everything, like if you just be like, yeah, but like what is Git? Um, or, or, or you're just like, yeah, but like, how do I install Git? Or, or, or like, what if I've gone over the concept of a repository and you want me to go over it again, just because you've kind of like lost track of it? Ask that question, we'll, re we'll just like quickly visit back and we'll cover it over again. Okay. Let so. your inner Texan come out. Just say, I don't <laughs> get it. We say, I don't it. get it. I don't get it. Amazing. Anyways. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay, 20 past, 20 past eight. We're doing great. Oh, at least stuck on time. Uh, let's do repositories. So you should be able to all still my screen. I am currently running macOS. Ooh, there was a little spy in our uh, Discord. Join our Discord if you haven't already. Um, 
Okay, so I'm running currently macOS at the moment. This is an uh, operating system, not Linux. Um, and uh, I mean, like what I should probably talk about right at the beginning of all of this is a terminal. So we're going to open a terminal. Uh, there is, with every macOS uh, thing come with, comes with it, there is a terminal application that we can use and interact with. Um, I don't actually like the native terminal application that comes with macOS. So um, I am instead going to use a piece of software called iTerm2, which is uh, a, a pretty much like an, a, a, um, a terminal replacement piece of software um, for macOS. Uh, so iTerm2. This look is a, it's a black terminal rather than a white terminal, even more badass. Um, so like super basics of terminal access, it is basically um, a way of, uh, running commands, running like rather than me clicking on buttons and, and interacting with things through buttons, I just run commands and those commands give me some feedback. Uh, so uh, let's do a command such as um, ls. So ls is, or I could do ls minus one and that will list out things if, with one one entry per line. Uh, and this is going to list out all of the things that are in my current folder or current directory or whatever. Uh, so I've got applications, desktop documents. And if you're familiar with macOS or if you're familiar with any computer system that has a file system, you will notice that that is very similar to my um, my folder here. So I could interact with my, my little window here and see all my stuff, or I could just open a terminal and interact with it here. Um, it's in a slightly different order. Um, but that's just ter the terminal being a little weird. Um, I could do another thing such as PWD, which is print working directory, which is users mat, which happened to be where my uh, where this folder is in the first place. Uh, so I want to change folders. So I want to go into the downloads folder. Um, the folders are also called directories. If you've if you've not heard of that, I'm going to use the term directory from now on. Um, simply because when you're working in a terminal and when you're working with Git, you tend to use the term directory a lot more, but you can think of a directory in a folder as essentially the same thing. So if you want to change to a different directory, such as the downloads folder, or the channel downloads directory, I can use CD, which stands for change directory and type downloads. And I can now be in the downloads folder. And that is basically just like me going in here and double clicking the downloads folder and me being in the downloads folder. And so this is what is working with the terminal is like. It's essentially a, a very condensed text-based version of working with your computer. Um, and when you're working with Git, um, you can use Git as a command. So like CD or like PWD or like LS, the, of these commands that I've been using before, Git is just another one of the commands. And if I don't provide Git with any special things, it says, here's some information about how to use Git. So, um, so that's a little introduction into the terminal. Uh, I can see the out of my directory by using two dots and I'm back in users map. So when I CD'd into downloads, I was in users map downloads. Hopefully you all get it. Um, it's reasonably straightforward. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, repositories. Uh, so a Git repository is essentially a directory that contains lots of code um, or lots of something, lots of files. Um, we can essentially create a Git repository uh, on our local machine by just doing Git in it. So let's make a let's make a repository. Brittany, please name an animal. Panda. A panda, great animal. So I'm going to make a directory uh, called panda, and we can see if I open my uh, little GUI here, my little uh, UI folder window here. I've made a directory called panda. I can cd into panda. And if I use the git init or the git like initializer um, script, I can run git init and it's initialized me an empty git repository inside of panda, uh, specifically inside of panda.git. So the .git folder 
uh, inside of a Git repository is super important. This is essentially the database. Uh, this is where the database of Git is stored. All of your changes, all of the Git related information, all of it is going to be stored in the Git folder. So if I do ls uh, minus one, currently it shows no folders in there, but if I do uh, ls minus a to show all folders, then it shows me a hidden folder in here called dot git um, because folders, the directories that start with a dot are usually like hidden away, uh, even on like Windows and 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 Microsoft uh, operating systems and Mac OS and Linux and all that sort of stuff. If you got a dot at the start, it's usually a hidden folder or a hidden file. Um, anyway, so we've got all of our Git stuff is going to be stored in the dot, the dot Git folder. Um, you will most likely never, ever, ever go into the dot Git folder. In fact, I would recommend you not ever going into the dot Git folder. If you go into the dot Git folder and accidentally change something or accidentally delete a file, you could ruin your whole Git repository stuff. I think I, I think I opened a, a dot Git folder once and I immediately went, oh, I'm not supposed to be in here. And then exited out of that folder. So I highly re recommend don't touch it. Um, the only one time I think you would touch it is if you want to start completely from scratch. If you want to get rid of all of your historical changes, if you want to get rid of everything except for the files that you have right at this moment, you can just do remove the .git folder. Um, and that will get rid of it. So if I do ls minus a, it is now gone. And if I try and do any sort of git commands like git status, it says this is not a git repository. What the hell are you doing? Um, so I can rerun git in it and it will reinitialize it. So I've actually sneakily taught, already taught you the second command <coughs> uh, when working with git and that is git status. That is basically what is my current status? What am I doing right now? Uh, it is a command I run whenever I'm working with a Git repository. I pretty much run Git status between every other command that I write. I can do like Git commit, Git add, um, all sorts of other things, Git merge, Git rebase, all of these like clever, <coughs> clever commands and everything. I run Git status so much to the point where I actually um, created a shorthand version of Git status, which is just got Git S, uh, which does exactly the same thing as Git status. Um, so you can even create like little alias commands as well with Git. Uh, it's super clever. So if you ever see me write Git S, that is me just being muscle memory and just writing Git uh, because I don't write Git status all the time. I will try and write out the full commands um, as much as I can, but um, sometimes I forget. Sometimes just muscle memory takes over. So Git status is just saying that I am on branch main. Uh, I do not have any commits yet and there is nothing to commit. So I'm on branch main. Um, that is a concept that I will come to in a minute. We're, we're going to talk about branches. Uh, we're going to talk about main and different sorts of branches. And there is nothing to commit, essentially meaning that I don't have any like files ready to commit and I don't have any commits yet. Uh, but we'll get onto branches and commits and mains and stuff later. But that is essentially a repository. It's a folder containing stuff. Um, and inside that folder will be a .git folder, which contains all of your Git information. Uh, a remote repository is essentially the same thing as a repository, just somewhere else. Where that somewhere else is, you can choose. Um, one of the most popular places to have as a remote repository is GitHub. In fact, it's so popular as a place uh, where we have uh, things. It is something we have the Coding for Immigrants organization on here um, for working with uh, remote repositories like um, like we are going to in this session. So I'm going to create a new repository here and I'm going to call it Panda. Um, I am going to make it private so that no one can see it. And I'm not going to initialize it with any special files or anything. I'm just going to cr create an empty folder. 
Okay, and it says quick setup. If you've done this kind of thing before, you can just like do all this sort of stuff. And it, GitHub is even so useful that it says like, hey, you can do all of this stuff if you want to create a new existing repository and things. So um, should, should we follow this? Yeah, screw it. Let's follow this. So um, we're going to do echo something into this. So I'm just going to copy paste this. Matt, Normally, can I interrupt you? Yes. Yes. Um, is there any way we could get the web page as well as your terminal a bit bigger? We're having a little yep. bit of trouble seeing both. Absolutely. That is fine. I will Thank make you. this stuff bigger. Absolutely. Oh, is that good right. for everyone? Can everyone see that now? I think that they can. Amazing. I hope so. Sorry about that. I have I have very sharp eyes, so I can like see all of this sort of stuff. But hopefully you can uh, hopefully you can make all the web the, make out the web page now in there and these git commands. So here we've got cd, we've got pwd, um, we've got all these commands that I've been writing. Thank you. Here we go. Um, Okie dokie. So let's just copy these commands. So I'm going to copy this, and I don't really care much about what this is going to do, but it's going to echo that essentially is the, the, the terminal version of, of a print line. Uh, and it's going to feed that into a readme.md file. Uh, I tell you what, if I do code, I can open this up in Visual Studio Code, because that is a special command that I can do. Uh, and I can put this side by side so I can run some commands and work with code at the same time. So here we go. So we're in the Panda directory. Here's a readme.md file. Hopefully, if you've worked with VS Code before, you'll be familiar with this. I can create an index.html file and do HTML. Uh, let's do head. Uh, let's do title. Uh, let's call it new thingy. Uh, actually, now let's call it Panda. Uh, let's create a body and let's create a P and say, Panda. Okay, so we got a look. Pandas are cute. Let's say that. Pandas are cute. Amazing. So we've got a little index HTML page here. Uh, this is some code. So, um, normally when we're working with Git repositories, we tend to put lots of like main like base repository files like readmes and things in the root of our repository uh, and then we'll store lots of code in a source folder so let's create a source folder and move our index.html file into our source folder that is our source code after all um, and so we have like uh, a panda readme and here it says git init well we've already done that and we can do git add readme. And this is, this is an introduction to a next command, which is um, to add stuff. So does this kind of bring me on to this? Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to actually come back to branches. Um, here. Yeah, branching. We'll come back to that. OK. Let's talk about where are we now? Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. We are. We've just finished talking about re remote repositories. Um, so we've created a remote re repository on GitHub. We've called it Panda, and we're gonna we're creating some files on our local machine on my MacBook. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to work with the working directory. We're gonna learn a little bit about untracked files, tracked files staged files and generally preparing for a commit. We're then going to commit our files. We're going to push it up to our remote repository. We're then going to learn a little bit about branching. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about pull requests and merge conflicts. And then we're going to just go over some common features. In fact, I've already touched upon a couple of common features, which is source and the readme.md files. We'll go into the last two later on. OK, so. We're at remote repository. Let's move on to the working directory. So the working directory is essentially the special term for um, 
kind of the files that you're working on right now. So you can kind of think of here, source, index, HTML, readme and everything. Um, this is my working directory. This is, these are the files that I'm working on at the moment. And with Git, if we ever want to check what's happening on my current working directory, as I've told you before, we can just run Git status. And it tells me that I'm on a branch main and no commits yet. We'll learn about branches and commits and things in a moment. But I have some untracked files. <gasps> oh no, untracked files. I can use git add uh, and specify a file to include what I want to add. And I, these are the untracked files, a readme.md and a source folder. The folder indicative, uh, indication is the fact that it's got a slash on the end. Uh, nothing added to the commit, but untracked files present use git add to track. So untracked files appear here, appear here in red, and they are essentially, if I try and do anything with git, if I try and do any, create any records in git or these commits in git to try and, um, track things as I go along and create these changes and create new versions of my software, I need to track my files. Um, and when we're initially just creating files out of out of complete nowhere, like we have been doing with readme.md and like with uh, index.html in the source folder, um, these are gonna be initially created as untracked files. So to track them, um, then we can just do git add and we can add the file. Uh, so I can do git add readme md. Now, adding every single file that you add in individually can be a real bore. And most of the time, you want to just add all of the files that you've created. So I can just do git add dot and that will just add in all of the files that I will create. So currently, if I do git status, I can see that I am now tracking um, this new readme file, I've created a new file called readme. And if I do git add dot, uh, that will just add all files that are in this Panda repository um, to be tracked. So I can now do git status again, and I can see that I have now created a file called readme and a, uh, a file called source index.html. Um, and if I want to create another file in here called like um, in here called uh, let's create a new file called cool file uh, and I can put whatever I like in here. And I do get status again. Then we can see here that we've got um, two files created and this cool file. And I can just add dot git status, oh, git s. There you go. I'm already using my aliases, muscle memory. Uh, then I've got a cool file here. So uh, we have untracked changes, and now we have these tracked files. Um, so not only are they tracked, but they are also staged. And what staged means is that essentially, if I run the git commit command, which is essentially saying I want to put these files, I want to put everything that I've got staged uh, to be into Git and I want it to be, I want to create a new version of my software. I want to create a new like point in my version history to say, this is what's happening here. Um, and to do that, I need to do Git commit. <gasps> oh my God, there's a dog that has come to say hello. Hello doggy. Would you like to say hello to some people? Hello, would you like to Hello, learn Donald, Git? You, would you like to learn about Git? You would are you not like a to learn Git? You're not a Git, you're a doggy. Yeah. Should we go back and play some fun? Come on. Do you want to go play with the toys? Yeah, Git, Git's boring for doggies. Sorry about that distraction, but hey, dogs are cute. Um, you also got a snapshot of my girlfriend's legs there as well. <laughs> um, wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah, Git commit. So we want to create a new point in our version history. And to do that, we need to run git commit. Uh, we need to create a commit. Um, so we need to create a commit. And with every commit, we need to say what we've done. And that comes with a message, a commit message. So with uh, git commit, we can use the minus M. Um, these, are, these are called flags 
uh, in a terminal in terminal applications. If you do minus and then like a letter or minus and then a uh, and then a word, that's usually referred to as a flag. Um, so we can do git commit minus m, and then I can type a message. So I'm just going to do my initial commit. This is actually saying initial commit is stereotypically the the very first commit of any Git repository is just initial commit. So I can do git commit initial commit. Now I've got like a special thing where I have to type in a password uh, before I can do my commits. Um, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, most of the time when you're working with Git, you probably won't have to do that unless you do some advanced stuff like I did and have this password thing set up. Um, although now that I've typed in the password, it probably won't ask me again for another, another like hour or so. Anyway, okay. So upon doing this commit, it gives us a bit of feedback and says what's happened. So we've got three files changed. We've created this readme, we've created a source call file, and we created a source index.html. Uh, these have got numbers associated with them. These are probably to do with like permissions that the file's on. I don't actually know because I don't need to know. If I did need to know, I could look it up and find out what's going on here. But the very basics of using Git, you don't need to know this sort of stuff. But all I know is that it, I've got a readme, a source, and a call file. The 10 insertions is probably to do with the fact that in total, I've written 10 lines of code. So I've got one in here, I've got eight in here, and I've got one-ish in here. This is technically a new line that is empty, so it doesn't count as a new line sort of thing. But in total, I've created 10 new lines of code, hence why it's got 10 insertions, and I've got three files changed. So I've created a git commit. So if I now do git status, it currently says there's nothing to commit. My working tree is, is clean. I've, I've, got, I've got nothing to do. There's no tracked files. There's no untracked files, whatever. Um, well, actually, there are tracked files. There's these files because we've added them. But there's no changes to any files that have happened. So let's make a change. Let's let's change panda pandas are cute, and pandas are cute. That's that's not correct. Pandas are super cute. So we've made a change here, and we can see in in programs like Visual Studio Code that I get a little thing here, and it shows me what's changed. And it's only doing this because this is a Git repository. If this wasn't a Git repository, it wouldn't show me this like special thing of changed because. Vis vis uh, Visual Studio Code is not clever enough to do version control stuff built in. Um, it leverages Git to be able to tell me this. So here I can see that I've got a change of pandas are cute to pandas are super cute. And if I did git status, I can see that I am on branch main. We'll learn about branches in a moment. Um, I am, uh, and I have some changes not staged but I don't have any untracked files. And that's because all of these files are tracked files, but this change that I've just done is a unstaged change. And how do I stage that change? Well, I use the same command that I used before by just doing add. So I can do git add, I can do git status, and I can see that I have now staged, I've prepared this change to be committed in. So, um, say I've also edited a uh, cool file. I have also edited this to include something special like, oh, I've accidentally pasted in my super secure password for something. Um, please, by the way, if your password is password123, change your password and do something else. But I've, I've been silly here and I've accidentally pass, uh, a print, um, pasted in my password to, I don't know, GitHub or something. And I don't want to put this into my next commit, but it's here, it's a change that's on a file, but I can see in here that if I do git status, that my changes for uh, that are ready to be committed, that are staged, are in source index.html. And if I wanted to stage and put into my next commit, cool file, I could do by doing git add dot, uh, and adding all of the things in, adding the, the file in. But if I don't want to include it, I can do git reset. And that is essentially just going to undo the, uh, the add command. It's just going to reset things. Now, there are special advanced usages of the reset command where you can even like 
really like hard undo check hard undo edits that you've been doing to files but for now i'm just going to reset source cool file and we can see here that Matt. whilst yes we have a question <gasps> we have a question um, oh. we have a question so you only Indeed. and the question is so you only have to stage your files once to move from untracked to tracked uh, yeah, so untracked to tracked is essentially when you create a new file and you need it to be, start being tracked, you can just do git add. But then from then on, it is a tracked file. Uh, if it, if a change is made, git will pick that up and you just then need to stage things when you're next, when you're wanting, when you've made changes and you want to go into commit. But you will never have to like retrack the file because it's already being tracked. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. No worries. Um, okay, so I've run git reset source call file, and that has not undone my changes. My changes are still there. My password is still there. But what it has done is that it has unstaged my uh, my um, my cool file from being ready for my commit. So now if I run, if I do my git commit and I say in my messages, pandas are supposed to be super cute, not just cute. That is my message. I can commit that in, I can check the status and I can see that my unstaged change was not put into the commit, which is super important because if this code was going to be made available to other people, uh, if I was going to be collaborating on it with a team of people, or if it was going to be made open source and be shown to the entire world, I don't want to be showing my passwords to people. So it's super important not to commit that stuff into your history, uh, things like passwords. Um, or if you just had made a bunch of changes and you don't want some of those changes to go in, you can just not put them in. You could just leave them unstaged and you can just stage and commit whatever changes you want to put in. Uh, most of the time, I would say you want to stage all of your changes and you can use a feature that we'll talk a little bit later on called git ignore to be able to ignore certain files from being staged or even tracked. So we've we've created two commits now. Uh, there's a lovely little command called git log that shows us our commits. We have an initial commit and we have a second commit, which is pandas are supposed to be super cute, not just cute. And each commit has a unique identifier along with it. So I can see that I've got this commit is identified by cd1ca blah, 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 and d1b04 blah, blah, blah for the initial commit. Uh, there is a thing called head here. Head is essentially just pointing to where I'm currently working. Uh, we'll talk. We might talk a little bit about head um, later on. It's a fairly advanced concept uh, when we're working with Git as to learning what head is and and how it operates and things like that. So we probably won't cover it. Uh, but essentially, at a basic level, head is essentially the uh, where you're currently looking. Uh, so these files and things, I'm currently at my latest commit. If I wanted to go and have a look at my old commits, or if I wanted to go and have a look at some other piece of code in this repository at a different point in time, or or in a some subsystem of Git, I can move the head around to put somewhere else, and it gets kind of super complicated. Hence why I say it's an advanced topic. So we're not going to cover that. We have another question. Another question. Can you go oh, right, fire away? Can you explain logs again? Is that all your commits? Yes. So a git log is essentially the list of all of your commits, or, or at least the list of all of your commits on at this particular branch. Um, there are, yeah. John and Selma are going. John and Selma are going? Yeah. Okay. Bye, Bye John and Selma. This is John. This is Salma. They're going home. Yeah, yeah. Bye, John and Salma. Bye. That is a very derpy dog. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that interruption. This is my life now. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so git log is essentially just yeah, it's it's a log like you would have a, like a ship's log if you're if you're on a pirate ship and or like if you're if you've ever watched Star Trek and you've heard um Patrick Stewart go captain's log. Uh today we investigated this star blah 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 blah. blah. Um the git log is essentially just the record of all of your commits. Um so running git log is just saying, I want to have a look at the list of all of my commits. It could be two, like we have here. If you're working on a project for a long time, for several years, it could be hundreds, if not thousands of commits um, in your log. So that's what the git log is. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about branches, but I'm not going to, because that's I'm saving that for uh, in a moment. So. That's working directory. That's untracked, tracked, and staged and praying for commits. And we've even done some committing. We've even put in some changes. Now, I want to undo this stuff. So I'm just going to set it back to that and not have any changes. So I can now see I have nothing to commit. Let's talk about pushing and pulling. So all of this stuff so far has only happened on my local machine. This is the single independent thing that is sat this is this is what I was talking about earlier about how Git is such an like an independent thing. It doesn't require network access. It doesn't require any of that sort of stuff. I've just been using Git and some files and a text editor, which is Visual Studio Code, to do all of my source code stuff and to track all of my version history. But now let's push this code up into GitHub. So we have already our empty repository of GitHub, and we want to push this up to GitHub. We want to store this remotely, whether it's for backup or whether I want to collaborate with another developer on this Panda repository. So what I can do is I can copy uh, this uh, address of where my code is. Now, you can either uh, keep the address as HTTPS, which is like a normal uh, URL. I suspect this will probably, HTTPS will probably be the way that you normally will work with things. Um, for uh, within Git uh, initially, but um, as soon as you start working with it professionally, you'll probably actually use SSH a lot more. Um, in terms of using them, and either of them, it's pretty much the same. Um, it's just SSH requires a little bit more setup uh, at the very start when you're first setting up your your um, your like GitHub profile, uh, whereas HTTPS doesn't really require any setup, uh, especially if you're working on uh, public open source repositories. Uh, so for today, I'm just going to use SSH, but no, please know that these commands that I'm going to run uh, would work as well for HTTPS. It's just I did a bunch of config like three years ago uh, when I first created my GitHub profile. That means I can set up SSH there. Anyway, so I'm going to copy my uh by just pressing this button my ssh like address this is the address for where my uh repository sits and i'm going to tell git that uh regarding remote repositories i want to add one and i want to add one called origin and i want to add uh, and i want to say that origin is found at this address now why have i called it origin that is because it is the standard name for a remote re remote repository. Um, if you, whenever you're working with Git, you could work with multiple remote repositories, but the high is highly likely. I think I've only ever worked with multiple remote repositories like once, maybe twice in my career. Um, but for the most part, I've only ever worked with one remote repository. And that is usually because you only need one remote repository, you only need one source of truth for where all your code is stored. You can back up that elsewhere if you wanted to. But when you're working with remote repositories, which is usually when you want to collaborate with other developers, um, there will only ever be one. And the standard name that is written into the Git software for where that, um, that remote repository is called is called origin. So if I had if I'd created um, a remote repository already and and done some clever stuff around with Git um, in another way, uh, that I might not have necessarily needed to run this command to add my remote repository. But if I'd have done that, the default name for the remote repository would have been origin. 
So whenever I'm wanting to do a push, whenever I'm wanting to work with the remote repository, a lot of time I'll want to use this name origin rather than typing out this full long thing. So back to business anyway, uh, I'm going to add a remote repository uh, called origin found at this location. Enter. Nice and simple. It's gone and done it. Now what I want to do is I want to push my code up. So I could do uh, git push. Um, I am on the main branch. We'll talk about branches in a moment, but I want to do push everything that is on my main branch uh, up to origin. So I want to do git push origin main. Um, and I'm going to press enter. And this is going to push all of my code up. Now, what does push mean? It essentially means upload. Like you would upload a picture onto Facebook or a picture onto uh, Twitter, or you would, um, I don't know, like open up the, um, what's the app that people use nowadays? TikTok, I'm, I record, a t I'm totally not on TikTok. I'm an old man now. Uh, he says at 26 years old. Um, <laughs> but let's say I've recorded a video and I want to upload it up to TikTok. A push is essentially an upload. <sighs> I can hear TikTok. you giggling in the background, Brittany. The TikTok. I had to unmute. Indeed. You had to unmute Those just a damn kids and their damn. Their damn. I hope Chuck's. I hope John didn't leave because of me because I messaged him and I was like, hey, Seth Rogen, we can all hear you. <laughs> no, he, he won't. Have. No. He's probably really tired. He's been really tired recently and busy, so it's fine. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, sorry. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. He's doing like PhD level stuff. It's crazy. Um, or he's like a blind group. I don't know. This is not relevant. Um, let's yeah. talk about. Uh, so we've just pushed up. We've just uploaded some stuff. Uh, so now if I refresh this page, we can see, oh, there's a readme.md, there's a source folder. If I click on the source folder, there's my cool file. There's my index.html. If I click on my index.html, I can see my code that is in here. I can see, oh, I've got two commits. I can click on this commit and see I've got an initial commit. I've got pandas are supposed to be super cute, not just cute. cute. I can see uh, that this was done 11 minutes ago. I can see that it was done by me, Harmelodic, which is my username on GitHub, by the way. Um, so all of this stuff has just been uploaded. And it's super fast. It's super like easy to use. I just pushed it up. Um, so that's pushing. And pulling is essentially like, oh, well, if I had made a change here in GitHub, or if somebody else had made a change, say I'd gone into index.html, and I changed this to like amazingly cute, amazingly cute. And then I created a Git, I created a commit in GitHub. I could say amazingly cute, not just super cute. Uh, I can commit these changes, and that's now in my Git repository in GitHub. But it's not on my local one. It hasn't changed on my local one. So to get that down. What's the opposite of push? Well, we pull it down. So I can just do git pull origin main. And that will pull down my changes and say, oh, look, I found a change where source index changed. And I can see in here in my text editor that it's changed. So this is a way of uploading and downloading changes in your code by just doing git push and git pull. Super simple. And if, and if you don't want to write origin main all the time, you can even set up like a little hook uh, like shorthand thing where you can just do git push and git pull without even origin and main. So I have a question about pulling things sure thing. from GitHub. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, you don't have to pull your commits and then repush them whenever you want to make a change to the code. You can just keep pushing new versions. You can just keep pushing new versions. So if I change this as like uh, our amazingly with capitals um amazingly cute and then i if i made a change here uh to say back to saying fantastically i don't even know if that's a word and i committed that stuff in uh this now says fantastically cute but i've 
changed it to amazingly cute. So now if I do uh, git status and I commit this in and say amazingly cute, uh, what's wrong with that? Oh, it's because it's got an exclamation mark in. Yeah, don't put exclamation marks in commit messages. It screws everything up. Oh, there's my password thing again. Uh, if I try and push that now, um, oh, this is the little shorthand thing, so I don't have to write origin main. I can just copy this and say set up stream. It basically means I want to always push to origin main. <gasps> oh, it's been rejected because updates are rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. So it says you can pull this stuff down. So if I did git pull, it will then pull it down. It will say, um, it'll go, okay, it's compressing. It's unpacked the objects. There's no tracking information. Please specify which branch you want to merge with. So I'd want to do git pull origin main. This is probably going to complain. Yes, it is. So I've got a conflict here. Um, so this is something that if you do actually change the same line of code uh, in two different places, you'll get what's called a merge conflict. Um, it's something that you ideally want to avoid at all costs. Um, but if you have it, a merge conflict, even merge conflicts are not actually that scary to deal with. They essentially look like this. It says, oh, we've got two things here. Do you want to call it amazingly cute or fantastically cute? Well, I think it should be amazingly cute in capitals. So I'm just going to delete the stuff that says fantastically cute and all of the surrounding things. And if I do git status, it tells me that I have stuff that's unmerged so I can add it in. And it says all conflicts fixed, but you're still merging. Use git commit to conclude the merge. Okay, git commit. Uh, this has opened a little thing to say this, we're going to merge branch main of github.com into branch thingy. I'm going to save that. And now if I do git log, I now see that it's amazingly cute. Update the index HTML. That was when we changed it to fantastically. Then we've got amazingly cute and we've got an extra little commit in here saying that we merged the two together. Um, and now if I do git push origin main now the most recent stuff has pushed up. So I covered actually a lot in that moment. So let's just take a, a moment to just walk through what I did. I changed something remotely and then I changed something locally. And then I tried to push my local stuff up to my remote thing, but there was a conflict there because I changed the remote stuff and the local stuff in a, a like at the same time sort of thing. Uh, which wouldn't normally have caused an issue if they are changing the different lines of code. Uh, Git would have just been smart enough to go, oh, they changed different lines of code. I'm just going to merge it in and be clever. But because I changed the same line of code, I ended up with a conflict that I had to resolve. Then I was able to recommit it in and push it up. Hopefully you were able to follow along there. Cindy asked a question. She asked if we made changes yes. instead of push we pull our changes will be lost forever right um some no uh so if i made a change here if i said pandas are probably cute um but then i made a change remotely in my cool file that says rather than whatever i like in here i say Pandas are cool even in the cool file. And I commit this in. Uh, cool file pandas is my commit message. Uh, and I commit that in. Now I have a commit that is remote, but I also have unstaged changes that are local. If I just do git pull in this scenario, it will pull down my local changes. Oh, I need to set this upstream thing. Um, Main, main. Okay. Uh, so if I do git pull, it will pull down my remote changes, but it won't get rid of my local changes. Um, sometimes if these local if these local changes are conflicting with your remote stuff, then um, it can cause problems. What I would just highly recommend doing instead is finding a little bit of a process, which is if you're ever going to do a pull down 
um, of anything, you'll want to probably commit in your stuff or you'll want to make sure that you don't have any changes at all uh, and then deal with any conflicts in the merge conflict way. Um, but if you've just got changes that aren't conflicting, like they're in different files or they're in different lines on different files in the same file, um, then it shouldn't cause any problems. You should be fine. Thank you, Matt. Uh, like if we make changes in our local core uh, code and we yep. commit instead of the remote, mm -hmm. um, then if we pull instead of push, then do we still lost them? Nothing happens. No, if we pull, uh, if like all the pull does is just check if there's anything local. So in this case, I've got pandas are probably cute. I can do git commit probably cute. I've misspelled it there. Oh, I need to add my changes. Um, uh, if I do a git pull now, it will just say I'm already up to date. But if I check the log, my probably cute commit is still there. So if I do a pull, it's not going to overwrite anything. Um, I, it will then, I can then just do git status. And actually, now that I have a remote setup, it says I am on branch main. I am ahead of my origin main by one commit. So I can do git push to publish my local commits, which I'm going to do. And there. And now both are back in sync. Nice and simple. Oh, nice. So like, as long as we remember to commit, then yep. we will be able to track it. Like exactly. Yeah. OK, great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, okay, dokey. Let's keep moving because I realized I'm already over time and I've just gone back to pushing and pulling. So if people are okay with staying uh, for a little longer, we'll very quickly finish up these things. I mean, I've already covered merge conflicts, so uh, I don't need to worry about that sort of stuff. But let's talk about branches and pull requests now. So as you will have probably seen, this word main has appeared a lot. Uh, now, main has, historically has not been the the uh, main, like the name uh, of our like main uh, sort of place where we're working with our code. It used to be called master, um, though master has some negative connotations uh, like master and slave and that kind of like whole uh, hint towards like slavery and stuff of the past. We're trying to obviously as a society move on from that. Um, so uh, a lot of people are using main, including me. I, I like to use the word main, my main branch. Um, hence why I've been using it here. Um, so, but branches is like another feature of Git is that you don't always have to be working on a single like line of history. You can sort of like sort of like a timeline in, in like Back to the Future, you can create different timelines by creating different branches. And you can like create a branch and then you can like merge a branch in back into the timeline. Um, and so this is what it is it, by meaning branches. So if I currently do git branch, I can see that I have a single branch called main. So like a tree, I have just like, I currently just have my, the trunk of my tree. It is just growing up and I currently don't have any branches. But let's say I want to create a new branch. Um, I can check out that branch. I can go and start working on that new branch by doing git checkout minus B to say I want to create a new branch. And I'm going to call it um, feature slash um, uh, I'm just going to call it feature slash uh, uh, amazing. And so I now have, if I do git branch, I now have two branches. I have main and I have feature slash amazing. Now I could have called that branch anything. I could even create a new branch called uh, checkout be amazing. Um, and so I've got a branch there of main, feature amazing, and amazing. Um, a lot of the time you'll see people prefix uh, branches with the word feature or with the word bug or whatever. Um, and that is essentially because they want to keep their main branch, their main like trunk of their tree um, to be the place where all of the, the proper main code is put. 
And if they just want to develop a new feature, they want to do that on a branch before they merge it back into the main branch. They want to merge it back into the tree main trunk of the tree. Um, that sort of practice of creating like these little mini feature branches and then make, merging it back in is actually called trunk based development. And it is currently the most like widely used and widely recommended way of using Git and using version control um, in the industry at the moment. And it's the way that I use it as well. It's um, like super, super good, super good way of using Git. So let's say I am on, I want to check out the feature amazing branch. Now I didn't, I'm not using the minus B thing here because I'm not wanting to create a new branch. I just want to move to, I want to check out, I want to move to the, uh, just using the feature amazing branch. Um, whoops, I accidentally put some slashes in there, but my terminal was clever enough to work with it. And in the feature amazing branch, I want to uh, change it to just amazing. Pandas are amazing lead cute. Um, so now I can see that I have got uh, a change. I can add it and I can commit it to say um, pandas are amazingly cute. Um, and uh, if I do git log at the moment, I can see that here we have a, a, a history on main going all the way up to probably cute. And then I've got a branch on feature amazing. I can like slightly adjust that there. Branch on feature amazing. My amazing branch that I created before is also back on this change here, but my feature amazing branch is now one commit ahead. Um, so what I can do is uh, do git status and what I could do is I could submit this to GitHub and create an, and create a system for allowing other developers who might want to look at this code and double check that this change is all good before it gets uh, put into the main branch, before it gets merged back into the main branch of where the like main source of truth of all of this code is going to go. Um, so what I can do here is do git push. It's going to tell me it's not able to do it because my uh, my remote upstream GitHub thing does not have a feature amazing branch. So let's do git push origin feature amazing. Uh, it's going to push it up to GitHub and even Git already, the remote uh, GitHub has already said you can create a pull request with uh, for feature amazing by visiting this. And I could click this link, but I'm going to show you how to do it manually on GitHub instead. GitHub, even now, I've already gone back to GitHub and it's telling me feature amazing has just been pushed up. But I just want to show you that here, if I refresh, we've now got two branches. We have uh, the main branch and we've got the feature amazing branch. Now, note, I haven't pushed up the amazing branch yet um, or, or at all. So GitHub doesn't know about it. Um, so this is my amazing branch. Uh, I can even have a look at my code. If I wanted to switch to my amazing branch here, I could switch to it and go and have a look in my index file and see that it says amazingly and switch back to main and see that it says probably. So I can see that there are differences between the two. So let's say I want to take my, my feature amazing branch and I want to merge it into my main branch. Well, I can do that with a system called a pull request. Uh, on other bits, on other websites uh, that aren't GitHub, they're often called merge requests. Um, but just know that a pull request and a merge request is basically the same thing. And in fact, I think it just straight up is the same thing. It's not even basically, it just is. Uh, so let's create a new pull request. And this pull request or PR, uh, I'm just going to call it pandas are amazingly cute. And I'm just going to create this pull request. And this pull request is now going to say uh, it's got one commit that is different from the main, from feature amazing, which is the pandas are amazingly cute. And I've changed one file to change the word probably to amazingly. Uh, now, if I was another developer, I could come in here and review the change and say, oh, yes, I viewed this file and I approve of this change. 
Uh, now, because I'm not a different developer and GitHub knows that, it says that if the author of the change can't be the approver of the change, uh, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but if I, if we, I had another developer, then they could approve that change if they wanted to. Um, but since I haven't set up any rules to say in GitHub to say that I need an approval to merge it, I can just say merge this pull request. There are different options for different styles of merging, like squashing and rebasing. Normally, I would say I would always squash and merge. What that actually means, you don't need to know right now. You're just going into the basics. Once you're getting used to Git, you can get into a, thinking about what squashes and rebases and stuff are. But for now, we're just going to do the default, which is just merge it. So I'm going to merge. I'm going to confirm the merge. And rather than it opening the dictionary, it is going to say the pull request has now been successfully merged. I can now delete the branch if I want to. It's pretty much useless now because everything's been merged into the main branch again. So I'm going to delete it. And if I now go back to my code in GitHub, I can see that, oh, my change of pandas are amazingly cute has been put in. I can check my index HTML page and see that it says amazingly, not just probably. But that's the remote. That's not my uh, that's not my local machine. I want to get those local changes in. And how do we get local changes? Well, we pull them. So on my local machine at the moment, I'm on feature amazing. We have a question from Cindy. We have a question. Um, oh, can we do can... first? I mean, it's not like urgent, so it's fine. I mean, oh, but this is interesting. interesting. Yeah. But anyway, yes. Or do you want to ask it, Cindy? <laughs> it's just nice to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. oh. Go on, <laughs> do it. <laughs> yes, the, the question I have is that can we do? Because I see you're you're using the the terminal command command line. Uh, so I was wondering, like, can we do commit via the IDE you're having in the right uh, yeah. string there? Like, because I kind of remember it's possible to do push pull and commit in VS Code, yes. but um but or is it better uh best practices to use the command like the like, terminal that you like I, the way you're doing it now i would say it's not best practice to do either uh i would say it's totally down to preference what mm -hmm. i would say though is that knowing how to do it on the ter <sighs> knowing how to do it on the command line um is extremely handy um and like basically anytime you want to do anything advanced, uh, you're pretty much gonna have to do it on the command line because there are some things that VS code or other or other like applications that give you like a bit of a UI um, just don't offer those sorts of features. I personally have a preference over doing it on the command line. You can do it in virtual, Visual Studio Code if you wanted to. There is a system in place to do it. I believe you can go into view, uh, SCM and you can like look at like publishing branches and uh, look at uh, or I can do the uh, where would it be in um, appearance do, do, show activity bar here we go so here they've got like a, a git bit here and I could like type in a message so if I changed something here save it and I'd be able to see that my changes have been made here. So you can do oh, that yeah. stuff in Visual Studio Code and it can mm -hmm. be a bit more visual and helpful in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I would say knowing the basics in the terminal is super useful uh, and it can often be faster for you. But if you feel more comfortable in Visual Studio Code or working with a visual tool, you can absolutely use it. Got it. Thank you. No worries. Was there any other questions in the chat? Or was it just that? Adila has a question. Stop. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no. I was like, are you two together? No. No, no. no. Do it. <laughs> I just want to name out her out. I just want to name her out. Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> anyway, where was like, I? The giggles here, too. Sorry. Oh, indeed. All the giggles. All the giggles. Right. Um, so we've talked about branches and we've talked about pull requests. Pull requests are essentially a way of working within GitHub to, uh, or working within any other tool like GitLab or Bitbucket or anything like that. Um, let's go Panda. Oh. 
uh, to be able to merge code from a branch into another branch. Uh, you can do it from any branch to any branch. You can even merge repositories into repositories if you wanted to. Um, the most common way that you'll be using it though is merging a branch containing some changes into the main branch, which is where like the source of truth is for your application. So let's say you had like a website and you wanted to make some changes to that website. What you'd probably do is have your website be built and uh, sort of dependent on the main branch. And then anytime you wanted to make a change, you could either make the change directly on the main branch and it would just go and directly update the website, or you would check out a branch, uh, make your changes, submit a pull request so that other people can see those changes and go like, oh yeah, I think that's right. Or go, hmm, should the website be blue or should it be green? And ask questions on that pull request and it'd be a bit more collaborative. And then once you've all agreed and you've got an approval, you can then merge that branch into main. And once it's been merged into main, then your website will go and update. Uh, and so it's a really nice kind of flow of being able to develop things and collaborate together on your code before things actually happen is by branching and merging. Um, so branches, pull requests, we've already covered merge conflicts because I kind of covered that before. And that's when you make a change in one place and a change in another place and you try and merge it together and you've got conflicting changes in there. That's what a merge conflict is. So let's talk about the final couple of things, final thing, which is common features of repositories. So as you've already seen, as I already uh, showed earlier, we have a readme file um, that is usually rendered in a pretty way uh, on like GitHub and GitLab and all these websites, uh, a readme.md. Um, it is pretty much the starting file for anybody who wants to look at a repository and go, what the hell does this repository do? Uh, well, the readme file should probably tell you what to do. Let's say I want to go and find React. Uh, I believe Facebook have React on GitHub. Um, so if I search for Facebook React, I can find React. I can go into, is React on GitHub? Have they moved it or something? Or is it somewhere else now? Let's find just a Facebook. It's like users or something, oh, Meta. Uh, oh, it's under meta now, it's under it's <laughs> bloody meta. Um, so yeah, so here I've got Facebook React and really if I wanna start working with React, most likely I wanna read the readme file um, because it's telling me, read me. <laughs> and so I will start and read through the readme file and you can make readme files look super cool um, with all like clever code syntax and stuff. I mean, here, even here we can see it. we've got 125 branches in React We've got 14,808 commits. It's a lot of code uh, and lots of folders and things. Uh, interestingly, they don't have a source folder. Hmm. Well, lots of code does have a source folder and clearly React doesn't. Whether they're doing something wrong, whether they're doing it wrong or something right, who knows? But I would just say that a source folder is a pretty common thing, is where your source code is going to be put. The readme file is another common thing that you'll have. Um, you also might have a git ignore file. Now I hinted to this earlier. Let's say I create a file in here called like passwords or it might not necessarily be passwords. It could be some sort of information that I don't want to put into git. I don't even want this entire file to be put into git. And I can put all of my special super secret passwords all in here. Um, I never want to get, I will never want to put this stuff in Git. I want Git to ignore this file. And that is where the Git ignore file comes in. It is a hidden file that we put at the root of our repository. And in this file, we simply just name files and directories that I want, that we want Git to ignore. And you'll notice here that Visual Studio Code has already done the super handy thing of graying out the password, the passwords file to tell me that Git is going to be ignoring it. So now if I do Git status, I can see that the Git ignore file is an untracked file, but passwords is nowhere to be seen because 
Git is going to ignore it. So I can add the Git ignore file and I can commit this to say um, uh, Git ignore file to ignore uh, important files not to be shown publicly. And I can push this up. Uh, oh, I'm still on feature amazing. Uh, sure, I'll push it up to origin feature amazing. Um, and I'll create the pull request. Create the pull request. Now, feature amazing is technically slightly behind main at this point. Uh, but seeing as I haven't done anything to conflict with main, then I it, then Git doesn't care. It doesn't care that it's a, like a, it's a, maybe a, a, a commit or two behind. Git is going to be smart enough, and GitHub is going to be smart enough to be able to merge all of this stuff together. So I don't lose any history. I don't lose any files. So I will merge it all together. I'll delete the branch, and I can now do Git checkout main and Git pull to pull down all of these changes. And there's my change to source it index, and there's my git ignore file as well. Uh, and really noticeably, the password file that I've put in there is not in the Panda repository in my remote. So if I made this publicly available, my super secret password is safe and stored on my computer. It's not safe, though. If somebody accessed my computer and read this file, whatever, but it's it's at least not on GitHub is the main point here. So that's Git ignore. It's a special file that Git understands natively how to work with, and it just ignores files. Super useful. And finally, license. You will have seen if, when we checked out uh, the Facebook React file, uh, React repository, um, that they had a license file in here. And when you're working with open source software, like software where you can see the source code. That's what it means to be open source. Um, it is super important for your code to be licensed. If it is unlicensed, then it is under the standard copyright rules of whatever country you're in, I believe. Um, but if you want to make your code open source and free to use to other people, then you'll probably want to license your code. And to license your code, uh, you don't have to go and talk to a lawyer. You don't have to go and do all of the crazy legal stuff. Um, a standard practice within the uh, software engineering industry is just to check in and commit a license file that essentially stores the legal notification for the license. Facebook use MIT. The MIT license is used per, like a lot in lots of different things. GitHub has a nice little thing here to say, what the MIT license allows you to do and doesn't allow you to do. Um, but yeah, if you want to make an open source project and make it available for other people to use and download and, and work with and operate in a, in a reasonably legal way, then you should totally license your code. Uh, if you want to license your code, I would go onto GitHub and go and find this page about licenses and learn about the different sorts of licenses. My personal favorite license is the GPL3 license. It is the license that Linux is under. It's the license that Git is under. It is a extremely, like, it is basically like, this is free. It will always be free. Make use of whatever you want to do whatever you want with it. But if you're going to do something with it, if you're going to change the code, if you're going to try and make money out of this, you can't. You have to make it free. If you're going to make changes to my software and make it available for someone else, you have to make it free as well. It's a very um, sort of opinionated license in that regard, and I quite like that. Uh, if you want to make, if you want to open source code, but make other people, if they want to use it and make money off it and make software to make money off it, you could use the MIT license. That's a pretty good license for it. Um, and so, when it comes to all of these licenses, you can just create a license file and put it in the root of your repository. So apologies for finishing this on a bummed out sort of a, like legal <laughs> legal talk and apologies for running over by half an hour. But that's Git. That's how you work with Git. It's just a little terminal application that you operate with. You can like do all of this version control stuff. You can upload stuff to GitHub. That's how you work with it.
questions before we finish up? Um, very quickly, 30 seconds. Like, where's the best place sure. to learn more about Git? And Wimmy in the chat, he did ask for a re or a repeat of um, Git Ignore, but I kindly asked, told him that I will send him the recording because we are so past time awesome. and I need We're to so go past to bed. Time. And you have, cool. you have friends to entertain as well. <laughs> it's fine. Sorry about that. So if you want to learn more about Git, I recommend highly going, I highly recommend going to the official Git website, git-scm.com. Um, hopefully you can see that website up here, git-scm.com. Uh, go to the documentation and like you can go to like the reference manual, learn about um setup and config and everything like that you can have a git there's a github cheat sheet here there's references there's a complete list of all the commands that you can use it gets super advanced and super crazy super quickly um but if you just want to get started yeah just like go to the git website and like watch some of the videos like about git basics it probably does a better job here you go git basics Five minutes, 59 seconds. I've taken an hour and a half. What's this guy doing? What's he doing with his time? Um, but yeah, go to git-sem, learn all about it there. Um, it's a super useful resource and it's official. It's the official website for it. So go check it out. I've actually seen that Git Basics video and I posted a link to the Git Basics within the Odin project, which is really good. It taught me uh, cool. Git. Um, and I would definitely recommend that video. And now I'm actually just going to go and read Git documentation. So awesome. fun times. Git talk, Git um, but, uh, Reading documentation is good. It's good for the soul. It is. It's boring, but it's good. Also, if you do have Code Academy Pro, which I'm assuming some of you do, they also have a Git and GitHub version control like, uh, course. like okay. course. Yeah. It, it, unfortunately, it is only within Pro, but of course, if you need free resources, hit us up on the Discord channel, and yeah. I will send them your way. Indeed. Sorry for running over late over everyone, but thank you so much.